This episode is brought to you by Death on the Nile, exclusively in theaters Friday. The greatest detective of all time, Hercule Poirot, returns to solve another deadly case. Join Poirot on a wild ride down the Nile River, promising luxury, intrigue, and murder. Grab your friends and get ready to solve this murder mystery on the big screen. Starring Kenneth Branagh and Gal Gadot. Premiering only in theaters Friday. Hi, I'm Catherine. And I'm Sheila. And we're taking you through private eyes. Catherine and I are going to discuss the tools of the trade, the different elements that we go through in order to get to our conclusion, which is to help our client resolve their case, whether it's a criminal case or a civil case. Catherine does criminal cases. Her methods and procedures are quite different than mine. So Catherine, I want you to go over what your first initial step when you get a case? I read the offense report. How are those? They vary from county to county. Some are better than others, certainly. They're a great place to start because the offense report outlines the entire investigation. So it's like a synopsis of the case against my client. And so for me, especially with not having to kind of start backwards, like I think maybe you do, not backwards, but from a different place, I get to kind of begin my investigation shortly after law enforcement begins theirs. So we're kind of, you know, working it around the same time. It works, that process works with my brain. (laughs) You know, it's in the right order of things. Uh, So the offense report will outline what the charge is. The probable cause affidavit um, allows, is basically just of short, an even shorter summary of why the arrest was made. Obviously, they need probable cause to make an arrest. So that's just a quick blurb. And then the offense report will go into detail about what step each officer involved takes, what witnesses were interviewed. Um, You know, sometimes there's there's additional stuff regarding evidence collected. When you get a report, is it important for you to look at the words and the statements and have like a statement analysis done? That's a great question. I So what I do is I print out the offensive part. I'm old school. I like my pen and paper so I can highlight, uh, you know, and at this point, I kind of know what I'm looking for. The the dates, the times, the important identifying information of individuals, of the facts of the crime as they're outlined in this offense report. So I print out everything, I highlight everything, and then I go back and I start and I read it again. And I'm putting it into my case journal, which allows me to start to kind of see what the progression of the investigation was based on what the law enforcement did. Um, and then that's it. That's all I do at that point. And then I go talk to my client because that's where it gets interesting for me. Based on what they say, I'm then taking what I already know the cops are saying, and then I am bouncing that off of what my client is saying. And it's my job to follow all the leads and not only retrace law enforcement steps, but also try to test out all the other theories that are potentially, that are possible. What do you mean by test out? Test out, meaning I'm following all of those leads and seeing if anything makes sense. And I'm obviously, if my client is saying he didn't do it or it was maybe wrong wrong ID or something along those lines, then by testing out, I'm, I'm going and I'm talking to who who could potentially be an alibi? Um, is there surveillance that shows that it could be potentially someone else? Those kinds of things. So following all the leads, that's important in um, being able to conduct a thorough investigation. Danielle, I think an offense report is important in the details, but also what details have been left out. Not just what an offense report says, but what it doesn't say. Exactly. That was going to be another point that 
what's interesting when I when I speak with my client is, and this has happened multiple times. This isn't really out of the norm. I'm not saying that it's you know every case by any means, but I will notice that what my client tells me there are sometimes witnesses that were left out, not only because they weren't spoken to by law enforcement, but there have been rare cases where they don't fit the theory of what law enforcement, the case that they're building against my client. So they're not even put in the offense report, even though they were spoken to by law enforcement. So that has happened before. And again, on rare cases. Okay. So Sheila, how do you start? What's the first thing you do? The very first step of any case that we take is go through the documents. What I have found every single family I've ever dealt with, and I work with victims' families, I go through the documentation first to see if there's even a case. I don't want to take a case unless it's a valid case. I have had people send me cases with the autopsy, the medical examiner's report. Some of them were ruled suicide. They were, in fact, suicides. However, certain family members just cannot accept it. So I am not going to work with a family and give them hope unless it's a a valid case. I've had to tell people, your son or daughter did commit suicide. Not always a popular thing to do, but I'm again, it's all about, is it a valid case? The basic thing I do is I take the statement and then I see if it physically could happen. So we do reenactments. And I'll use my case, my very first podcast was Lauren Agee case. I went out to where she died and I went to the scene There was no way what was written in that statement and the information that was in the files matched up to what happened to her. And her autopsy photos did not match what was put in the file. Okay, so when you say statement, we're talking talking about the offense report or the police report. Okay, got it. So typically in the cases that you take, you are, there are police reports actually created from these. Got it. One of the other areas I use is freedom of information. Great. And I'm just curious, and I'm sure our listeners are too, what's the type of information that we can get through that though? Because, you know, it's like, well, what's public? So it's very interesting. It's state by state. I have experience in probably 10 states. Every single state I have experience in, I've had to fight for the information. So you file a form, and and we'll use Texas since you're in Texas. They have a certain form that you have to file. You fill it out. The law is they have X number of days, and I don't have the number of days. It could be seven or 10. Since COVID, no one has followed that law at all. But Generally, they have X number of days and then they send the information or send the denial. I expect always to get a denial, first denial, and then you have to go back and resubmit it. You have to be very specific on what you want. For instance, if I'm doing a case and I want the 911 call, which should be public record should be over the airways, should be turned over in every single state. It is a battle to get the 911 call. I'll use Coppell, Texas as an example. It took a subpoena to get the 911 call. I'm actually surprised they even gave it to you with that. I still get denials on subpoenas. And it's funny because I get letters consistently from my FOIA requests from the attorney general saying why I can't have whatever document I'm asking for. And it's funny, they can just say no and then think people will go away. And that's typically what happens, which is why you're mentioning that, you know, there's other ways around that. Danielle, you can actually even appeal a decision that was made as well in certain states. Certain states allow you to appeal a decision on certain terms like either it was too broad or they fell under an exemption that the case is active. Um, 
the burden of proof is on the police. So you can always appeal a decision. That's good to know. I, I just got an, a denial on a freedom of information. And I kind of send them out, just see the level of cooperation from the police. And it gave a law in, in Tennessee. And I looked up the law and I thought, oh, you guys are kidding me. This is what you're standing on. So I had to write them and copy the law and ask him to define where my request fell. So it's a follow-up, follow-up, follow-up. Some family members don't know they can do that. But right. remember, freedom of information, that's how they got the Guantanamo Bay information. All these big cases that these investigative reporters have done, a lot of them came through freedom of information or whistleblower. One of the greatest things about my cases is there's always one or two heroes in them. There's always somebody who sees the disservice to the family and will talk. You never know, but if they get found out, they'll lose their job. Right. You know, I'm very careful on how I accept information, whether or not I know their name, but whatever's turned over to me is done in a very anonymous way. That always yeah. helps. And they know I'm not, I don't know who they are. Yeah, that's interesting. That's something that, again, is so vastly different between where you get your info and where I get mine. For fans of true crime podcasts, Generation Y is essential listening. Host Aaron and Justin cover cases from all angles. They break down theories, dive deep into forensic evidence, and discuss their opinions on the most perplexing cases. In a recent episode, Aaron and Justin looked into the case of funeral home owner Dan O'Connell and his intern James Ellison, who were both found shot to death in Dan's office. The murder went unsolved. Years later, while investigating a separate case, detectives interviewed a Catholic priest, Father Ryan Erickson, and he revealed information only the killer and detectives knew about the double murder. Then, Father Ryan hanged himself. With their only suspect now deceased, police and the community grappled with the questions left. Did a Catholic priest kill two men, and if so, why? Let's talk about breaking a case down to the basics, looking at theories and the forensics, and figuring out what happened. Aaron and Justin do just that. They bring you the cases so you can walk through what happened. Listen to Generation Y Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Okay, so just to recap, you start with the police report, kind of same way that I do there. And you're then analyzing what it, whether or not what they claim could have even happened or what are the possibilities? Well, and I use linguistic people. So I use people who can look at a report and say, yes, this this person's telling the truth. Now, I know that just sets you off. No, it doesn't. I actually think that it's interesting. I don't know. Can you actually explain that a little bit more though? They're reading a report and who? what do they do? Their job or their skill or talent is to look at a report. And there are some, there's a whole vast group out there that have done it. I've worked with several of them. And some people through my uh, podcast have come up and become PIs and are studying to be linguistic people. And they're fantastic. I'll utilize their skills. We'll go through a statement and there are indicators in a statement. I'm going to use Lauren Agee's case since I've talked about that the most in my podcast. When there was a statement from one of the campers who was with Lauren that night that said that girl didn't say her name, spent the whole weekend with that girl, but didn't say her name, Lauren. Immediately, I'm like, something's wrong with that. Yeah. 
something that obvious made me go, I need to look further into that person and talk to that person. Absolutely. I will. I totally agree with that. Yeah. It, what it does is it, it's a red flag and it's something that you make note of and then you go and follow that flag and see where it, where it takes you, certainly. But you have all those skills, don't you? I do. You know, I'm a believer in having other eyes. That's why yeah. I like crowdsourcing. That's why I like groups because, as you know, I like people coming in and telling me where I've missed things in a case. And Absolutely. it's wrong. You know, yeah, and that's, that's a good point too because, again, we can't catch everything as one person. So you really do, you are afforded that ability to be able to utilize as, I mean, more eyes on a case, the better, right? Absolutely. Plus, bringing someone in like yourself, who's the defense side, Brandon Perrin's another example. I had him look at some tapes for me. Brandon Perrin is a defense private investigator out of Florida, also taught me the component method that I use to this day. I wanted to know how the defense thought. Brandon Perrin was the first defense guy I ever brought into a case and ever thought there was a tool to use from him, his knowledge and his background and his expertise, it has helped me in many cases where there are holes and I had to go plug those holes. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's such a smart way of working a case, especially from your perspective. Well, from anyone's perspective, really, the more eyes you have and from different backgrounds and and experiences, the more you can just really figure out wh- what it is that you need to do to make your case solid. We're taking a case right now where we're looking at the documents, talking to the family members. That's always important. One of the things that I think that's different between you and I on taking a case, I married these people. This is a long term relationship. It's not a year. It's usually several years. I have to be able to say to the family member, it's usually the mother, you're going to have to listen to me and I've got rules and these are the rules. And if you can't follow them, I'm done. So I have gotten rid of clients because they can't follow the rules. Well, I imagine for you too, there's some boundary setting that has to take place. in your marriages with these people. For me, it's a little different because, well, mostly 99% of my clients are incarcerated. So um, there's not a whole lot of boundary setting that needs to happen outside of being in jail. But your clientele and my clientele are so different. And that's what's so interesting about it. So you take on a case, you've reviewed the documents, you've determined that can't be done that way. And so there's something that you need that you're you're going to get involved now. What happens next? Then we start working the cases, probably the same as you. We start right. interviewing people, which is my all-time favorite part of any case is the interview. Yeah, for sure. I mean, actually, I think because you and I've interviewed together, you know how much I like it and how much I like to just hear the person and listen to what they're saying, but we have to know what they said before. You can't go in not having that background. So if Peter said that he wasn't there and he actually was there, it's a great conversation. Mm -hmm. I have been yelled at. I have been thrown out of rooms and houses and all of those kind of things. And I think that's very exciting. (laughs) Yeah, it is exciting. Yeah. But you're right. We do, we do that the same way. So I, so for me, I've met my client. Now I'm back in my office and I'm comparing what my client says Where are the holes? I'm creating timelines, if applicable, of course, to see if what actually makes sense, what fits. And then, of course, some of the things that I'm asking my client are, okay, well, if it wasn't you, then how do we prove that? Who Do you have an alibi? All of that kind of stuff. If there is potential for surveillance videos to be a part of... you know, If it was in a public place, for instance, then... 
That's typically what I'm going to do first. Assuming that the attorney has appointed me to the case immediately, because here's the honestly, the most frustrating part about a case that happens in public where you know it had been caught on camera somewhere is that these establishments re record over their videos, you know, sometimes in a few days, a week, you, you know, and if the cops didn't obtain that footage, then there's evidence that's been lost forever. So if I don't get out there and one of the first things I'm doing is, all right, where did this take place? Where is it in a public area? And in Austin, this is also something to note for other cities. We have, uh, the police department has put up halo cameras, which are, I can't remember what they stand for now, but they're cameras that the police department has put up in the, um, in the city, you know, in downtown area to, you know, monitor activity. So the, that's another part of surveillance that we know exists that obviously often gets disclosed through discovery. But in the event that, you know, it's at the Circle K down the street, and then there's also a few houses and there's a bunch of ring cameras on these houses and the cops didn't bother to ask, you know, knock on doors and ask whether or not there was footage, then that's something that I could get immediately And I don't have to wait for it to come through discovery. And maybe it shows a different angle. Maybe it shows more witnesses. Maybe it shows that some of the information that they wrote in the offense report isn't checking out. And so at the very least, it's showing that there isn't that level of accuracy that you would want to see in a case against someone being charged with a serious crime. Angie's List is now Angie, your home for everything home. With Angie, you could cross your next project off your to-do list before this ad is over. Just tell us what you need and we'll handle the rest. Sending a top pro to get it done. Or browse reviews, compare quotes from pros, and connect instantly. All for free. For everything from routine maintenance to a dream remodel. Because however you want your project done, we'll get it done. Download the app or go to Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com to get started. I think one of the most important tools that Sheila uses, and I want to know if you do, Kat, as well, is cell phone records. If you don't have any surveillance videos or ring videos or anything, the most important thing could be cell phone pings and and records to establish that all important timeline. Is that something that you rely on as well, Kat, on the defense side? Absolutely. Um yeah, we, you know, a lot of people don't know how much your cell phone is recording exactly every move you make. You know, if you have a Google account, we can get down to the exact point location on where you were. And so there have been times where I had a murder case dropped as a result of some of the evidence that came out through cell phone data and location records. Um, and that obviously is a huge deal. So absolutely, that's something that we use and it can be very important. That's a really great point. One of the things that I found out, though, is not every police department utilizes the analysis of cell phone records. And that was pretty surprising when in public records through FOIA, the information, the cell phone information was there. And it said the police officer wrote the statements of the witnesses line up to where they were. We took the public record cell phone information, plugged it into our stuff, and matter of fact, watched them move, and they were not where they said they were. So the police report was absolutely inaccurate. And who did that serve? Nobody. My job is to find the truth. So if the statement and cell phone records don't match up, then what actually happened? Right. But going back to those witness interviews and talking about, you know, what is it that we need to know before we're out there? So again, before I go visit my client, the only thing I look at is the offense report because then I want to hear what they have to say without, you know, having my judgment clouded or a decision already made. And I listen to them and, you know, from beginning to end, that's when I come back and I'm comparing the the facts 
and going back through the discovery. So one of the beautiful things about Travis is that we have a database that the prosecutor shares with us as defense, like with the attorneys. And then the attorneys can add me to the website to be able to review all the discovery as it comes in. And that's just honestly amazing. So I don't have to rely on the attorney to send it to me. We don't have to ask the uh, prosecutor, you know, where is this and this and this. Uh, Everything is nicely labeled. I can download everything, keep it in my own file, and then review it as necessary. So then I come back and say, okay, well, were they interviewed by the police? Um, You know, I'll watch body cam videos of these interviews. And then I'll watch what statements or read whatever statement the witness is before I go out there. To, it helps me tailor my questions around, you know, all right, what did they say? And when am I going to know if they say something different? Is that, are, are they, you know, consistent with their truth? If they're, if they're lying about it, is it because they remembered it differently? Is it because they're lying, you know, intentionally? Those kinds of things. Where do you start in your questioning with some of these witnesses? Now, you have to understand, I work two different ways. I work with attorneys. I work with some attorneys. I get to pick and choose the attorneys I work with. Then I work with some families. When I have an attorney, it's great because we've got a wrongful death case. We're subpoenaing things. When I'm working with a family... We don't get to do that. So we have to rely on freedom of information. So it's two different paths and you have to tailor how you're going to do it. And one of the things that I utilize is the media, which I know you don't use. Yeah, that's such a big difference between us. I Obviously, all my cases are open and pending trial. There's nothing I can say to the media. There. It would also not benefit me in the same way that it does you. There's no real purpose to it. My take on it, and I use the podcasting as an example, is what a great tool to put the information out there and let witnesses actually come to me and call me. Yeah, I used to have to follow up and find them. Now they're hearing the podcast and it's going around their groups and I get phone calls from it. Witnesses that I've tried to locate and, and talk to me call me because they heard the podcast. I mean, that's amazing. I am certainly not getting witnesses to call me ever. Um, I am knocking on doors and staking out houses and sometimes literally stalking people. And then they talk to me, probably more because they think they have to, but at least, you know, that's how you find, that's how I get people to talk to me. I wish they would just call. That'd make things a lot easier. It's my favorite thing when I get a tip. You know, somebody called and I let people call in anonymously. And if they leave their information, I will go see them. One of the greatest things that happened in a case, it was public. There was a, uh, Crime Watch Daily is no longer around. And that was my all-time favorite group of people to work with because the the producer I worked with was amazing. They um, they followed up on everything and they fact-checked everything. So Crime Watch Daily came and did a case. And because they did a case, there was a lot of comments. I read every comment that somebody puts out there, whether it's a Facebook page or, you know, Reddit or whatever. I follow those. There was a comment made that they knew this person and they had committed a crime in previous situation. They made that anonymously. Well... Yeah, you and I both know we can find anybody. So I showed up at that person's workplace, sat on the step and talked to them about what they posted. What a win. That's such an amazing... Those little gems that we get along the way are so special. (laughs) They are special. And I just recently had a witness come forward about a violent past of a suspect in a case. Wow. And, you know, it's 
again, I love that people reach out to me and help me. And that's what I believe I bring differently than you. I want the public involved. Yeah. You don't. (laughs) No, I don't. Yeah. Not until maybe it's over and there's maybe some injustice like the media does on most true crime documentaries these days. Right. (laughs) Yeah. They definitely do that, right? But, but yeah, part of it, you know, for families doing a documentary, doing a Crime Watch Daily or a Dateline, those are those are benefits to the family to finally be able to speak up and tell their story. Right, absolutely. Or in the flip side of that, I mean, not saying that I have any opinion about the Rodney Reed case, but look at how much media attention he received on an innocence claim or, you know, like the side, the Anand Syed, you know, all of those cases you would never know about. And those are, those are the, my potential clients that then come out in the media. And that's the benefit of the media for them. If, you know, it's something that needs to be, you know, reviewed or discussed after the fact. It was pointed out to me that the people sitting in jail are victims also. However, there are so many groups out there, innocent project groups that are helping those in jail. I still feel like I need to help victims, families that haven't even ever been heard. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's necessary. And yeah, I mean, we can have the argument about who the victims are. Obviously, I'm not going to sit here and say that some of the people that I that I'm defending aren't guilty or or are are or are not victims. But, you know, in terms of the Innocence Project and they do great work and they take cases kind of like you do. They're a giant organization, but there's they imagine how many cases that they look at every day. I can't even imagine that they're able to review all of the potential cases that could allegedly be, you know, innocence claims. Exactly. And I will say the difference in, you said they're a huge organization. I am a party of two and you're looking at the party of two, me and Danielle. Right. I am lucky enough. That's the other thing in the way I do things. I'm lucky enough to have a network of very giving. You're one of them. Danielle's one of them. Giving private investigators who will help me with cases. Yeah, because all in all, it really does boil down to one thing. We want, we do want justice. We want the truth. And that is the end goal, no matter what. And so whether I'm helping you on one of your cases that you're working on with families, I still find that I have a skill set that could be valuable to the family. And just because I do defense work doesn't mean that I don't feel for or want to help victims as well. I can do both. 